These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. Over the last two episodes, we looked at the rise and fall of the Neo-Sumerian period, the last gasp of Sumerian culture. But what got skipped over in all the discussion of kings and societies is the actual material of Sumerian culture. What sort of things were created in this blossoming golden age? Well, part of that is because quite a lot of the stories I've already told, and many of the stories we associate with Sumerian culture, have their oldest fragments dating to this period. Is that because this period sees an unusual rise in literary activity, or is it because clay from before this is much less likely to have survived through the ages? Probably both, but it is undeniable that the Third Ur dynasty helped cement what later empires would come to consider classic Sumerian, which was important because they would be growing their own culture very self-consciously on top of what the Sumerians had built. We've actually covered nearly every major written story of the Sumerian period, which is honestly kind of a shame, since we know that much more was written, and in this highly imaginative and primarily oral culture, so many more stories must have been told that simply don't survive till today. But one genre left to look into is the wisdom literature, which both tells us about how ancient people thought about things, and also it becomes a foundation for later moral and philosophical literature among the much more prolific Babylonians. I did look at some wisdom literature already in the episode entitled Instructions Manual, if you want to go back and give that a listen. But today I will be focusing mostly on the genre of dialogues, since Sumerians love to give advice, but even more than that, they loved to argue. Sumerians were a deeply practical people, but also incredibly legalistic and competitive, and debate and argument permeate throughout their culture. We have whole texts that are just extensive lists of swears, in which the writer is going for paragraph after paragraph, talking smack about some poor person who's forgotten to history, except for details about his stench, his monkey-like face, his low intelligence. A certain fellow named Engar Dug is described as a croaker among singers, a man without good judgment, and a bragger. This last being an especially hated attribute. Sumerians couldn't stand boasting. He was, in appearance, a monkey, a rogue, a witness without shame, who does not accept a verdict. And here again, in these diatribes, we see what really matters to the Sumerians. Engar Dug bears false witness in conflicts, making him dishonest, a universally despised trait, and interfering with the proper running of the court system. And that court system is as old as writing itself, with court records detailing the results of property disputes and divorces from well before the Akkadian period. We see it in proverbs like, when a man comes forward as a witness saying, let me tell you what I know, but does not know the relevant information, it is an abomination to Shamash. And to accept a verdict is possible, to accept a curse is impossible. And brotherhood is founded on the words of a quarrel, but at the witness box, friendship becomes known showing that while honesty was a core value, the Sumerians were mature enough to know that it interplayed with other values, like family loyalty. The author of the tablet found many more faults with poor Engar Dug, noting that he despises the leader of the work gang, he loves crosstalk and deceit, and when on duty as a warrior, he holds back. It seems he steals from his brother and provides no water to others and acts like a lamentation priest or a snake charmer in constantly shifting his words or advice. But even poor Engar Dug doesn't have the worst of it. We have another diatribe about a fellow whose name is unknown, referred to simply as the seed of a dog. He, according to our ancient complainant, reeks of the stench of a mongoose with a disfigured face and confused judgments, whose intelligence should be compared to a dog. 
This fellow is a negligent madman with evil mouth and forked tongue. Interesting, that last bit, to see an idiom that has survived through languages and millennia to apparently mean the same thing now as it did 4,000 years ago. This, too, is likely the result of the Bible. This man would sit on the bank of a river and not even offer a pole to a drowning man if he had one next to him. He's a thief who breaks into houses and even steals the hinges off the door for the metal. Now this is less silly than it sounds, since door hinges would have been made of metal and thus rather valuable, though obviously quite inconvenient for the burgled homeowner. This particular man quarrels and disturbs the household. His advice is not good, and he never calms a heated quarrel. He's smitten with himself, and he makes himself important. And at the end, he's cursed by the writer to follow an unfamiliar path and walk along the thorns of the mountains, never to return. Such invective is amusing and reveals much about Sumerian cultural values for sure, but where does it fit in with the supposed topic of today's show, wisdom literature? Engar Dug is likely not very wise, but neither do we associate wisdom with the people who commit angry rants to writing, whether on clay, paper, or digitally. But it highlights the Sumerian passion for dialogue and debate, for being better and more correct than the other person. Taking it too far is being querulous, but generally speaking, being able to assert your own position and prerogatives was viewed very favorably in Sumerian society. That penchant for debate was not limited to other humans either. We even have a very famous work of theodicy called A Man and His God, a work that would become the model for later works on the problem of evil well into the Babylonian times. It is probably the single most direct work of philosophy that we have from the Sumerian period, with the opening directly explaining the message for us. It begins with the exhortation, a person should steadfastly proclaim the exaltedness of his God. I should probably begin before I begin by explaining that the average Sumerian did not typically worship the high gods directly. That is to say, Ishtar, Enlil, Ninurta, and so on were certainly well known and very popular with massive temples in their honor, but just like how the average person would not expect the king himself to come deal with their problems, so too they expected that the high gods, the ones with the most power, would be too important and remote to pray to directly. And so the Sumerians would commonly take a personal god, a minor deity with whom they would build a more direct relationship, and use that god as a step on the ladder to intercede with the gods that were more likely to get things done. Or often, the minor god would, like a general protective spirit, be the source of minor good fortune, protection, and magical energy. They were, after all, very big believers in magic, using oracles, curses, and prayers with a strong belief in the efficacy of each. And so, this is the personal God that each man should be championing in their daily life. The work continues, saying, A young man should devoutly praise the words of his God. The people living in the righteous land should unravel them like a threat. A man sings for his God to soothe the hearts of his neighbors and the heart of his God. For a man without a God does not obtain food. Now it turns out that there is a certain young man who does not focus his efforts on evil. And yet for some reason, he still suffers from grief and illness. This dire fate has confused the young man, and he's reduced to kneeling before his household altar to his personal God and weeping before it. He speaks reverently, but with exhaustion and pain, saying to his God, I have been put in my place by grief and despair. I'm young and knowledgeable, but somehow things don't turn out right for me. When I speak truth, it becomes false, and liars take advantage of me. My arms have proven to be weak. I'm miserable at home or in the streets. My shepherds are mad at me, and my herdsmen are plotting against me, even though I treat them well. My companions lie to me and lie about me to others, and never once have you, my God, intervened on my behalf. I'm wise, so why are my associates 
ignorance. Even though food is plentiful in the city, my only food is hunger. When shares were allotted to everyone, my only share is suffering. My God, before you I would say this. My tears are excessive, but I tell you these things because I need you to unravel the thread of my path. Sort out the confusion and show me what I've done wrong in life so that I may see the great plan. Is it true that I am inferior to all my friends and companions? My mother, my sister, my wife are all singing for you, O God, that you might hear my plight and fix it. My God, the day shines bright over the land, but for me the day is black. Suffering overwhelms me like a weeping child, and the Asag demon bathes in my body. I never see a good dream on my path, only unfavorable visions. My God, you are the Father who begot me. Lift up my face to you, God of mercy and supplication, and let me acquire noble strength. For how long will you be uncaring for me and not look after me? Like a bull I would rise to you, but you do not let me rise. You do not let me take the right course. As the wise men say, never has a sinless child been born to its mother. Making an effort does not bring success. My God, if you would let me know my sins, I would proclaim them at the city gate, both the forgotten and the visible ones. All weep for me in my misfortune. Please have mercy and compassion for me in your holy heart. May your heart be restored to me. And the man's God heard all this bitter weeping. After a great deal of lamentation and wailing had soothed the god's heart towards the young man, the god accepted his righteous words. The words of supplication which the young man had mastered, the holy prayers, delighted his god like fine oil. The god cleared away the evil words and the fate demon that had possessed him and turned the young man's suffering into joy, setting a protective guardian in his mouth. The young man now steadfastly proclaims the exaltedness of his god. Remember now, this was perhaps the most important single philosophical work written prior to 2000 BCE, an answer to the problem of evil that would ultimately influence the writing of the biblical book of Job, though it provides an answer that we today would consider very curious. Bad things happen because the gods will it. There are missing parts of the work, but it does not appear that the young man's sins are ever listed. It is stated that all men sin at some point in their lives. Indeed, we are born with sin, a philosophical position that is sadly expanded on nowhere else in Sumerian literature, despite being a proverb often found in proverb collections. So we don't actually know why the god is mad. What's more, it is explicitly said that it doesn't matter how hard you work or how good of a person you are. Your God can still become upset and bring bad things into your life. Now, it is, of course, necessary for you to work hard and be moral, since then your God would definitely get upset if you didn't do that. But being good for the Sumerians was no guarantee of good outcomes. Instead, all you can do is keep your God as happy with you as possible through praise and singing and magic words and hope that he stays on your side. At the very least, we can see how this viewpoint makes sense in Sumerian cosmology, since recall that humans are largely superfluous to the world order, having been made from clay because the gods themselves were too lazy to make food and beer for themselves. So for a Sumerian, a person's whole purpose in life is literally nothing but feeding the gods, and if you want anything past that, you'd better make sure that your god is happy. We have a lot of proverbs, in fact, that tell us similar things. The Sumerian scribes would, as a writing exercise in school, be forced to make many copies of common texts, and one of their favorite things to transcribe were common sayings and proverbs, since copying these would teach the young men how to write and offer good moral education at the same time. For example, they said, Fear of God creates good fortune. Lamentation absolves sin, offerings extend life, which rather cleanly summarizes the whole story here. Another collection of sayings reads, 
A man's God is a man's shepherd. A God will not desert him. A man's God provides him with something to eat and water to drink. A man without a personal God does not procure much food, does not procure even a little food. Going down to the river, he does not catch any fish. Going to a field, he does not catch any gazelle. In important matters, he is unsuccessful. When running, he does not reach his goal. Yet were his God favorable towards him, anything he might name would be provided for him. A man who does not value his God is thrown out in the desert. His body is not buried, and his heir does not provide his ghost with drinking water through a libation pipe. Now, the fact that this saying was apparently in common currency does not mean that it was universally believed. The Sumerians appear to have been generally quite pious, but we also get sentiments like, A man without a god? For a strong man, it is no loss. Which suggests that some believed destinies were forged by men, not gods. More interesting and subtle is the seemingly transgressive line, Earth is greater than heaven. Who can destroy it? A god's temple is founded on stone. Which calls to mind the fact that even though the gods created humanity, it is humanity who builds the temples and provides the offerings. And just maybe that gives humans a degree of leverage over the gods. In all honesty, it can be hard to ascertain just how deep piety ran, since nearly every text we have was to some degree or another directed outward, with some audience in mind, whether it be as small as the schoolmaster or as great as the entire country. And so expressions of piety may at times have been exaggerated for effect. But not every debate is hidden from us. Indeed, we have a whole genre of esoteric debates, with seven major ones labeled as the debates of creation. It's basically like this. You ever sit around with a group of friends and consider which fictional character would win in a fight, or which actor is sexier, or the merits of different political systems, or which restaurant chain has better hamburgers? These creation debates have the feel of a pair of overeducated, mildly intoxicated scribes, each arguing in earnest, but also without too much real investment in the outcome, arguing for sport or amusement more than anything else. Without a doubt, each voice in the debate was putting forth genuine arguments, but I honestly wonder if there's a clay tablet somewhere sitting in the sands that has the exact same debate written by the other scholar in which his side is declared to have won the argument. In any case, we've already looked at one of these, the debate between winter and summer, in the episode on the god Enlil. And Enlil actually shows up in more of these stories in his role as judge, but I wanted to save a few for later. Now being relevant later. So we will start with the most fragmentary. We literally only have two lines of dialogue for this one, though we believe it was originally as complete as the others. Still, reading the debate between the date palm and the tamarisk tree is short enough to quote in its entirety, and gives us a feel for the flow of these debates. We begin somewhere in the middle. The tamarisk opened his mouth and spoke. He addressed the date palm. My body is the body of the gods, for holy idols are carved from my wood. You grow your fruits, but someone places them before me like a maid approaching her mistress. You do not provide the measuring vessels. You are minor crops. Your attendants bow before me with you in their arms. In his anger, the date palm answered him. He answered his brother Tamarisk. You say... If people build dioceses for me and beautify them too, then certainly they do not swear by the gods before clay. You may be the body of the gods in their shrines, and people may name with a good name the dioceses of the gods, but it is silver that can pride itself as the overlay of the gods. If the core of wood is covered by silver, describe your beauty." And the rest of the debate is lost, but we see clearly here the point-counterpoint structure and the fact that each participant is stated to become increasingly angry as the debate progresses. 
we can only assume that this was the typical and likely even culturally expected course for argumentation, both of the serious and recreational sort. So having established that, let's move on to one of the more complete ones, and one of the easiest for us to understand as modern people, the debate between grain and sheep. This piece begins at the best place to start your argument, all the way back at the very beginning, at the hill of heaven and earth. An, father of the gods, realized that he had created all the gods, but he had not made grain yet, nor had he made anything that Utu, the goddess of weaving, could weave with, since there was no wool or even sheep. In fact, the Anunnaki, the great gods, did not even know what sheep or grain were. And for fifty days there was no grain to eat, and everyone went around naked. And in fact, Utu, the goddess of weaving, apparently hadn't been born yet. Anyway, everything was a mess, and people acted like animals, eating grass on all fours and drinking water from the ditches. Truly disgraceful. You would think that these people were no better than Gutians. Anyway, An fixed this, along with Ea and Enlil, and they put sheep and grain into the world, and everything was better. In fact, everything was so good that there was a great festival in which grain and sheep were the guests of honor. And everyone is enjoying the celebration until someone mentioned that there was a new arable field available. But of course, only grain or sheep can be put into any given field, since sheep will eat the growing grain and make it no good for harvesting. Well, upon hearing this, things got real ugly real quick. Grain calls over to sheep, each being a personification of their respective concept, saying, Sister sheep, I am your better. I am the glory of the land, and I grant my power to the cults of Ishtar. I am a gift from the high gods and central to all princes. I confer strength to the warrior and also foster neighborliness. I give destiny to captive youths and sort out quarrels between neighbors. In your sheep shacks and rural milking pens, what can you put against me? Sheep was up to the challenge, though, and responded, oh, My sister Grain, what are you saying? The high gods created me in the most holy of places. All the yarns of Utu belong to me. Shekan, king of the mountains, makes his royal emblems from my wool and twists his giant ropes against the rebels of the land. I'm speaking here of slings, quivers, and bowstrings. The elite troopers and the workers of the fields are given my gifts. And how could you have a water skin of cool water or sandals without wool strings to tie them together? All manner of sweet oils are somehow derived from sheep, though to be honest I'm not really sure what part of the sheep is required for aromatic oils. Anyway, the gown, the cloth of white wool, adorns king and god alike. The priests themselves wear woolly raiments, and you could toss your plebeian harrow, plow, and tools aside, for you have nothing to put against me. Answer me, grain. And again, grain speaks, saying, I got one word for y'all, beer. When your rams and goats are cut up and cooked for a banquet, it is my beer that takes the center stage and makes the feast into a festival. Your shepherd on the high lonely plains dreams of beer, but when your sheep dare to come down into the field high with the grain, the farmer beats you away with cudgels, leaving you stranded in the mountains and the open country with the snakes and the bandits and the creatures of the desert and the discomforts of the high plains. You are unreliable, having to be counted each night, kept a tally of constantly. Gentle winds blow through the city, but in the field we get high winds, the god of storms blowing through. These high winds scatter the sheep, but the grain remains standing right where it was planted, faithful and reliable. I am grain. I am born for the warrior, and I never give up. What can you say to that, sister sheep? 
And she picks up the verse in this rap battle, since in the original it would have been written in poetic form, though it's impossible to translate except as prose. The first paragraph is a bit broken up, though, and likely at least partially metaphorical, so it's hard to relate exactly. It ends with Sheep saying, Just like how a conquering army enslaves the people of a city, so too is grain taken up and crushed under a mortar stone to make flour. And having been mutilated and baked, the grain is then put on the table, but on any table with bread and lamb, the lamb will be the highlight of the meal, and bread a mere second. This hurts Grain's pride, and she responds with another hard-to-understand metaphor. Grain then says, Should I really bow before you? You're chopped up and separated into different containers and split apart. You're led around by a collar and a leash made of your own cloth. And then when people are in the market, one man says to the other, Fill my container with grain in payment for this sheep. Seeing the party growing sour, Ea, god of wisdom, calls to Enlil, saying, Sheep and grain should be sisters. They should stand together. But then he says, But of the two, grain shall be the greater. Let sheep fall on her knees before grain and kiss her feet. Whoever has silver or jewels or cattle or sheep should take a seat at the gate of those who have grain. And the tablet ends with the summary, Dispute spoken between sheep and grain. Sheep is left behind and grain comes forward. Praise be to Father Ea. As you can see, there is a degree to which this is a silly debate, but also one taken up in good faith by each participant. And in fact, we have a few common proverbs that confirm the result here, such as, He who has silver is happy. He who has grain feels comfortable. But he who has livestock cannot sleep. And a more common restatement of Ea's last line, He who has silver, he who has lapis lazuli, he who has oxen and he who has sheep, wait at the gate of the man who has barley. Both resources are obviously in high regard, but in this debate it is recognized that grain is more fundamental. After all, in the proverb, where there is no grain, this is a sign of vengeance turned towards the city. Where there are no reeds, this is the worst of all poverty. It is not sheep, but grain that is the sign of the god's wrath. In other debates, we have already seen that winter beats out summer, back in our episode on Enlil, and in a very long but also very damaged work, the gods pass a judgment that copper is superior to silver, again showing a clear preference in all three cases to the more practical debater over the more pleasant and luxurious. Even when the debate is between two utilitarian things, like the hoe and the plow, they take upper and lower class personalities. In this one, there is no scene setting. It begins by noting that Ho is the child of the poor, and then Ho immediately calls out to the plow, noting that it has basically one job, while Ho is a multi-use tool. Plow responds that, sure, it only has one job, but it is a job assigned by mighty Enlil, and when it comes time for the harvest month, the king himself leads a ceremony in which he sacrifices for the plow, then personally does a ritual first groundbreaking with all sorts of high-ranking persons flanking to either side. The people watch the ritual with joy. A field with his nice, even furrows is attractive, and when that field becomes high with grain because of him, it is even nicer. Plow piles up grain to offer for the high gods, and even the poorest take charity from the fruits of his effort. Ho, by contrast, is castigated as digging miserably in the mud. No one ever cleans their hoe. It just gets muddy as it digs wells and ditches, forever mucking about in the mud. Ho is called the wood of a poor man's hand, fit for slaves, not high-born types. Ho fires back, saying none of this matters, since in Enlil's temple at Nippur, it is the hoe that stands before the plow. 
Ho, if you'll recall from the episode Instructions Manual, was created by Enlil himself, after all. The Ho controls the course of canals and waterways and collects all sorts of food. It even builds bricks and flattens land. When the plow comes out, there are six oxen and four people, and plow is just the eleventh at the end of a parade. In any case, the Ho has already gone out and done the preparatory work for the plow. Plow is content with a single furrow, and as soon as it gets its head caught in the roots, its tooth breaks, and the plow has to be repaired by a whole workshop of artisans. Your work is slight, but your behavior is grand, Ho accuses Plow, the sort of character defect that would have been greatly frowned upon in a person. The Ho works twelve months a year, while Plow barely works four and is absent for eight, being gone for twice as long as it is present. Then Ho really begins to rant, and at the end of it, Enlil speaks up in judgment, favoring the Ho over the Plow as the more utilitarian and useful of tools, which just goes to show that gods love Ho's. There's also a debate between bird and fish that devolves into some really charming name-calling, which I'll put in the notes for today's episode online at oldeststories.net. But this should really give you a sense of the disputatious aspect of Sumerian character that would refine over the ages into ever more detailed legalism, likely a similar character trait as what inspired the religious commentaries of the Talmud. And these fundamental character traits and values that we've seen today are not unique to the Sumerian Renaissance period either. They matured there into written works that survive to this day, but we can see hints of their origins as far back as we care to look. And they'll continue to inform the coming civilizations and cultures of Bronze Age Mesopotamia. Next week. We're going to formally put the Sumerians to bed with a look at some of the modern pioneers who rediscovered this lost civilization and to whom we owe the information of this very podcast. And then we will turn to the biggest and most delightfully entertaining mistake in all of archaeology, Zacharias Sitchin and his ancient aliens theory. So join me next time as we pay our respects to some very impressive minds and enjoy the absurdity of the ancient alien's claim while we look at exactly what went wrong to make an otherwise intelligent person believe that the ancient Sumerians flew about in rocket ships and engaged in nuclear war in 3000 BCE. Thank you for listening.